This is the last few sessions for the day. Hopefully you're all really raring and ready to go because today we have Neil Brown. He's a kernel developer for SUSE and he's going to talk about something completely unrelated, Edlib. Please welcome Neil. Thank you. I must say I'm enjoying Geelong. It's a, a lovely little town. I really like the sunrise. That's the sunrise on, um, on Monday morning. Um, so there's a lot to like, but uh, there are always things I don't like. And I'm never comfortable with my editor. I use an editor all the time, and, and lots of it works really well. And I do enjoy it. But there are always things to complain about. And so I get to thinking, should I write another one? It's a difficult question. I, when I asked my son about another one, my son's a, a musician. He has a collection of guitars. I asked, well, how many guitars are enough? And, and his answer is, well, just one more. Maybe that's the way with the editors. Maybe just, maybe just one more. But of course, um, XKCD has something else to say about one more. With standards, you know, you have 14. You don't like that, so you, you have another one. And then you've just got 15. One more. Well, it doesn't exactly say, but I think the implication is one more is too many. Any of them are too many, maybe. So, are editors like guitars and just one more is a good thing? Are editors like standards and just one more is not so good? Well, that's a bump, didn't I said don't bump the cable, there we go. Um, so when I, I've talked to people about, about editors and you know, another one, the answer is usually, but, but Emacs. Like, you can do anything in Emacs, right? So Emacs is a good place to start. I must say, I love Emacs. I've been using Emacs for nearly 30 years, and it's all right, I love Vim too. <laughs> I don't actually use it as intensely. I, I use it fairly regularly. I've been using it for longer than 30 years. Uh, well, it was VI back then. Um, so, but it's, it, for the particular issues I'm looking at, it's, as far as I can tell, it's much the same. And it's, it's good for writing code, and it can highlight syntax, and you can run the compiler from it and stuff. And it's good enough for email. I have a, a love-hate relationship with Emacs, and I used Emacs, e, used Emacs for email, email for a long time, then I changed to Claws, and just recently I've changed back, and I've never been really entirely happy. Hopefully I'll be happy one day, but we'll see. And there's lots of add-ons for, for the IN for Emacs and stuff, but it's, it's not quite perfect. It can't be perfect, because if you go to Wikipedia and look for the, the list of text editors, um, I stopped counting when I was getting close to 100, but I'm pretty sure there's, there's over 100. Some of them are variations of VI or, or Emacs, but there's a lot of editors out there, so maybe, maybe one more is a good thing. Um, but a good way to, sort of, to think about, the way I'm, I guess the way I'm thinking about editors can be characterized by looking at the the MVC pattern, model, view, controller. So the model describes the thing being edited and the view is how you see that and the controller is how you control that. So looking at Emacs particularly, the model is a text buffer. It's, it's a very well-defined thing. It's a bunch of characters. Each character can have attributes and there's a amazing collection of attributes and you can define your own attributes. Attributes can be color, attributes can be whether it's invisible or not, various things. But there can be characters, there can be attributes, and you can have infinite undo, or indefinite undo at least. Um, so this is, this is a well-defined thing. And lots of use cases fit into having a text buffer like that. Um, but not quite everything fits into that model. This is, a, in a way, a, a simplistic example. But um, this is Emacs when you've asked for a list of text buffers, um, control XB. And it gives you a list of text buffers and a uh, list of currently active buffers, and there they all are. Except that that picture is wrong. Before I took this screenshot, I deleted the buffer called GNU Emacs, um, but the window showing that didn't get updated because it's not really showing you the list of text buffers. It's showing you a text buffer in which that list has been drawn, and it doesn't kind of get updated automatically. It's a, it's a, it's a two-stage thing. You can only ever see in Emacs a text buffer. If you want to see something else, it has to be drawn, and there's a little bit of a, an impedance mismatch. There's a similar thing happens with directories, and that you, you can see a directory, and if someone deletes a file, it doesn't just change automatically. And it could do. Um, there's, there's just there's two steps. Um, another example I like to look at is Hexel mode. If you ever want to look at 
the bi a binary file, which admittedly, I don't do that often, but sometimes it would be really useful to search through. And Emacs has this wonderful hexal mode that allows you to edit things. What it actually does is it runs an external program that basically does similar to OD. It converts binary into text and then puts the text in the text buffer and allows you to edit the text. And when you're finished, it writes the text back out again, which is certainly effective. Not if you want to do a hex edit of dev SDA, though. Um, something really big, that won't work. And in my role as ND maintainer, I've occasionally wanted to look at a hard drive and inspect the bytes. And DD pipe to OD, and it's, I'd much rather the editor just did it for me. But Emacs can't do that because it has this concept of a text buffer. So the text buffer can be a bit limiting. Uh, a number of, when, one of the things, the reason mail, the mail readers I've used don't seem to be a quite perfect because it doesn't really have a list of mail items. It has a picture of a list of mail items and it doesn't always update it quite synchronously. Um, back to our model. So we've got a text buffer that really isn't at all configurable and we've got a view which is again not really configurable. Emacs has Windows, and Windows show you what's in the text buffer. Now, that is modified by the, um, by the attributes you've assigned to characters. You can make characters invisible, so they're not there. You can make, if you make a new line invisible, then the whole line disappears. Then, you know, two lines get joined together, things like that. We'll see an example of that in a minute. Um, you can make characters in intangible, meaning you can't touch them. So if you move the cursor forward, it just skips over a bunch of characters. You can do lots of really interesting things, but it's not programmable. It's, it's a fixed set of things you can do that the makers of Emacs think was appropriate. There's no hooks to call on display. And an interesting thing I just found out recently is in, in that Hexel mode, um, which is what there. Um, that line across the top, that heading line, that can be different in each window and that can actually be programmable. You can put a colon eval in there and it writes code and that's how you get it to side scroll if you need it to. It doesn't automatically side scroll with the text but you can do that. So the heading line is completely programmable at display time but the text isn't, which is inelegant. I don't like it. Um, yeah, no hooks to call on display time. So, yeah, as you said, what you see is essentially what's in the buffer. And just to, to show you that doesn't have to be the case, um, demo time. So, uh, X3. Why isn't that working? There we go. So, edlib.mb is the the presentation they're looking at, which you can see as text, it's kind of markdown-y sort of stuff. And at the same time, we can see it as hex. You can see the implicate, there's something funny happening at the top, don't worry about that. And at the same time, we can see it as a presentation. So it's, it's different views of the same, that are completely different views of the same document. And if I make a change in any one, Hmm, I wonder if I can do, do that reliably. You probably will, I won't try it. The code is actually a bit unforgiving at the moment. Um, X1, and it goes back to full screen almost. There we go. So you see, there's a lot of interesting things you can do if you can see the same document from different perspectives. Um, you can at least have a, see, see things over your shoulder. Uh, no, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, that was the next slide I wanted, I think. That was just as well. So this is another example of, this is, no, that's the wrong slide. I'm still getting used to using this tool, you can tell. So that's where I was up to. And the next slide is this one. So many years ago, this is where my real frustration with Emacs, how it displays things, came from. Many years ago, I, I, was, I was doing some, uh, being treasurer for a community group and wanted to produce monthly reports. So I sort of had a spreadsheet and I pulled the information in and needed to get reports out of it. And reporting in spreadsheets is really horrible. And I, I liked tech and tech produces nice documents and the spreadsheet produced horrible documents. I thought, well, why don't I just put a spreadsheet mode into tech? And if you're, if you know LaTeX, you see that, you can see the tabulars. That's a LaTeX table. 
um, the ampersand separates cells. So there's one cell per line and there's a comment. So the percent sign introduces a comment. So that, um, uh, so the line, shall we say, that's uh, 28th August 2004, and then a comment, SSL to say this is a spreadsheet cell comment, and the number, which is presumably the number of days since somewhere, date one, which is how to format that field, and, and oh, something else. The, the expression, so the last thing is a formula to calculate. So put that, tell Emacs about all this, and I had Elis code that would turn that into that. It's a spreadsheet in LaTeX, so you've got all of LaTeX power for formatting it, you've got all of Emacs's power for doing the calculations. Um, and I got to that stage, I thought, this is brilliant, you know, I'm getting there, I'll be there in just another couple of days. Um, and then I hit a barrier, because obviously, you know, if, if I want to, so each of those cells can either be one of three things, it can be the present, presentation value, it can be the format information, how to format it, or it can be the, the formula, how to express it, and I want to be able to see one or the other. And to change between the two, I have to go and change a whole lot of fields to be invisible, a whole lot of characters to be invisible, and a whole lot of other characters not to be invisible. And I've got to make sure I do that every time the cursor moves, so that whenever the cursor's in the right place, I've got to do all this stuff. And it, it felt like I was doing assembly language programming. It was, felt like I was programming at entirely the wrong level. Um, and I fairly quickly gave up and hacked the solution in a completely different way, but that sort of left me with a feeling that I need more programmability in, in the output, and there are sort of various things it'd be nice to be able to do with that. Um, rendering, yeah, isn't programmable. Um, so I don't like the text buffer, it's, it's just one fixed idea. I don't like the, win, the window display because, again, it's just one approach. It's very configurable, but it's not programmable. And then the controller is, is where the magic of Emacs is. You can write all sorts of code in Elif. You can do all sorts of really clever things. And there's lots of, lots of clever, um, lots of clever mod modules and plugins and stuff for Emacs. That is really good. But Elisp, you know, really? I mean, I know Lisp is a great language. Um, but given that there's only a single use, this is, e Emacs is the only place where you sort of use eLisp, and certainly the only place I've ever used Lisp in, in any seriousness. Um, in this day and age, you know, you really want to be able to use a, a more modern language. I know Richard Stallman thinks eLisp is wonderful, and I won't disagree with him, but I don't, it doesn't work for me. You know, Python or Lua or Rust or anything else. C, I actually quite like coding in C. Maybe not for this. Um, but it is a great language, but it's, I don't know, it's a barrier to writing interesting stuff. Um, so I had a niche, and I had to scratch it. And I've actually tried this several times over the years, and mostly it's failed because I had the wrong vision. But early last year, I, I sort of tried again something new, and it, it started working, and it, it got as far as where it is today, so that was good. And, and the idea is that everything is pluggable. Everything is pluggable. There's, there's a core bit of set of abstractions that the other pluggable bits use to talk to each other. Um, but there is no one document format. I have several. I've got, I, I really wanted to implement a document format which was a raw memory map device so I could map dev SDA, but I didn't quite get to that. Um, but it, a text buffer, of course, with attributes, um, a directory, so it just looks right. The list of documents really is the list of documents. Um, it has mul can have multiple language bindings. Currently, I've only got C and Python, um, but I certainly want to do Lua just to make sure I can. Um, multiple renderers, and I'll get to what I mean by multi-stage renderers in a minute. Multiple display managers. Um, so to display, I can display on a text window on a next term using n cursors. I can display on x using, this is based on PyGDK because that's what I've written other x stuff in relatively recently. So it, it uses Python for that bit of it. Um, you could write, there's a clean abstraction, really, really clean. Um, so you could write a, a display to just, if you wanted, if you had a way to display in HTML effectively, there's no reason you couldn't do that. 
Um, yeah, and configurable key bindings, you know, obvious stuff. And almost everything is loadable from libraries. So the actual Edlib program I'm running here is maybe 20 lines of C code. It loads a dot, links to a .so, which is half a dozen files, eight files or so, and it loads maybe a dozen other .so's of particular mod, plug-in modules that, that the main, original program requested. Um, and if you wanted to make a different editor, because one more editor is not enough, if you want to make a different editor, you could just click together different modules. Um, so what are these, these core abstractions that, that make up, make up Edlib? And, and I, I was thinking that one of the, the big abstractions would be the document, but it didn't end up quite working that way. Um, everything, almost everything is based around a pane. A pane is sort of a rectangular area. Um, of it, it can produce output, it can receive input, it can just communicate with other rectangular areas. You notice there are several of them that are the same size. They kind of work together in concert to perform a particular task. So maybe the, the big dark gray one is, so there's, like, these are like objects, there is code kind of associated with each one and they can send messages between each one, each other. So the, the blue gray one at the back is maybe the PyGDK display renderer and the one in front of that encodes the global key bindings that are at the moment vaguely Emacs-like as far as it goes. And then the yellow one is a tiling manager and it creates four tiles in front of it, you notice. And each of those tiles probably has a stack of, um, so the first tile actually connects to the document, so there's a tile that actually connects to the document, and multiple tiles can share the same document. Um, the next one, a couple of them might be involved in rendering together. For instance, um, the idea that Emacs has of having rendering by specification, by just here's a text and rendering, is very powerful. It's, I don't want to throw that away at all, I just want more than that. So the document can either provide characters or can provide lines. And then there's a, a, one of the panes will take lines and you know, build them together and find, count back as many lines and forward as many lines as did on the page um, and then put them all there. Uh, another layer, layer at the front might have all the keystrokes, all the local bindings to that buffer attached to it. So each, each pane has, has their own particular role. This, this red one is I've, currently my search function that puts little, instead of using the mode line down the bottom, which is so last century, it puts a little pop-up at the top like that, just because I wanted it to be different, really, and because I could, you know. Um, I'd certainly like the option of putting in a status bar as well, and I've got a status bar, except that I've hidden it for that window, obviously. Um, so there's lots of different windows, and they're all kind of configurable, and you can add more to change the functionality. Um, yeah, they can have... I think they have different de depths. So particularly the bottom left one has got you know, three extra panes in front of it. All four of them probably have three other three or four panes in front of them as well. I just didn't draw them all. And so the top left, top left blue gray one, the red one is an immediate child and the equivalent of the purple one is an immediate child, but the red one has a greater, a greater Z depth, greater Z height, so it's closer to you. That obvious sort of things really. Um, the next abstraction is, well, documents and marks, more particularly marks. So a mark is a place in a document. And normally when you want to work on a document, you want to work somewhere in a document. And so you can have um, a whole set of marks. You have multiple sets of marks, um, which are, so all, all marks are linked together in, in the, a global list. And so they all have a sequence number. So they're all, you can easily compare two marks to see where they're up to. Um, but you can also, a, a pane can own a particular set of marks and say these are mine and it'll be the only one that creates those and it can go for first, next, next to previous within its own link. So um, the, the pane that draws, gets lines of text and draws them on the screen puts a mark at the beginning of each line of text so it can find out where it was and um, when, a, when the buffer gets changed, nearby marks get told. And so the renderer puts marks there gets told, you know, the mark gets told there's been a change here. So it could, if it was clever, just redraw that line. Currently it redraws the whole page because that's easier. But um, kind of the, the inf information is there to do less work if it's clever enough to do less work. Um, 
Yeah, so one, there's one distinguished mark that is, you know, the curse of the insertion points. And currently, that is a bit of a ward. It doesn't, cut, doesn't fit into the rest of the abstractions quite as well as I'd like to, so that'll probably change once I figure out the right way to do it. But marks are, yeah, the main interface into, into a document. And the document is just there somewhere. The, the pane that owns the document knows about the details of it. The rest of the, the rest of the editor just talks through that pane. And when I say talks through, something I should have. Um, hmm, going back and forth isn't so good. Um, messages go me past it. Tend to what normally happens is message goes out to the the focus. So there's every window has a concept of where the focus is. So when a keystroke is generated at that very back pane, which monitors the display, it follows the focus point out towards some frontmost pane, and then moves backwards until it finds somebody that handles it. And a new message starts at the same point and moves backwards until it finds somebody to handle it. So if you want to make a change for a document, you say, create a message that only a document will understand and send it, and it finds the document. And you don't have to know where the document is. You find it on each message being sent. Um, so the commands, the methods, messages, things to get it sent around, uh, they have a fixed set of arguments. Not all arguments have to be present, um, but so far I've managed to squeeze everything I want to do into this set of arguments. I occasionally want some more numbers, but I don't think I need them. So there are two panes in every message, sort of a source and destination, more of a, a message. The exact interpretation of them varies a little bit, but it identifies where the event is happening and who's handling the event, basically. Uh, a couple of integers for all sorts of uses. Typically, when a keystroke comes in, the integer is a repeat count. So if you type um, uh, alt 12 something, then the alt 1, 2 something, then the 1, 2 becomes 12 and is attached as the integer. Um, two strings, so when you're inserting text, one of those strings will be the text, another string for, because it's occasionally useful. Two marks, you know, two ends of a range. Um, two coordinates, x, y, maybe. Um, when a mouse event obviously comes with two coordinates. And you can have another command. And that other command has a number of uses. If you want to bind a keystroke to a command, you put the keystroke in one of the strings and the command the command and send it off to the, with a message saying make a binding. Um, alternatively, if you want to get a lot of information back from a command, you send a, a, the, the command you give it is a callback, which is a little bit clumsy, I think, but I think, still think it's the right thing to do. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's just, a, the important point is it's a fixed set of arguments that all commands understand, and so you can sort of translate between languages fairly easy. You don't have to worry about different signatures and stuff. And then there are, there are attributes. There are always attributes. Um, attribu attributes actually allow you to pass extra information if you really want to. Attributes are just a text string equals a text string. Um, so the, I've got a word count module, and you send it a mark saying, I want to know how many lines, words, and characters there are leading up to this mark. And it does the counting and attaches attributes to the mark. So when you get the mark back, it's got these attributes on it. So sort of a, a side channel for getting extra information around. It's, you can store, like every character in a buffer can have attributes. So you could mark spelling mistakes that way, maybe. Um, a, a directory document, there is one character for each file in the directory, and that character has a bunch of attributes, name, owner, date, size, permissions, stuff like that. Um, so that's sort of the, what the core of Edlib is. It's a few, particularly the panes, the marks, the documents, um, the attributes, and the ability to load other plugins. And so as I sort of hinted at that, I've got various plugins for things. I've got a text buffer, a directory document. I've got NCurses and PyGDK for displaying. Um, so when I'm to draw it, when you see a directory, the directory itself is just providing the, a character with attributes. And then the format renderer takes that character with attributes, it takes a format string, like sort of like printf, or I think it's percent something. Anyway, it does some interpolation gives you a line, and then the lines renderer takes those lines and stacks them vertically and puts them on the display. Um, the, the complete renderer 
fits just behind lines and does, is used for file name completion. So you basically you give it a prefix and it'll hide any lines that don't start with that prefix. Um, so it basically it's like, like a, kind of like a pipeline of, of panes that you can plug together in different ways. Um, you can have key bindings, obviously. I've got, I've got a, the Emacs key bindings I've got are very limited, um, just enough to kind of move around and, and insert and delete text to prove that it worked. Um, I, I keep, when I'm, when I'm actually editing things in it, I keep finding I can't do what I want to do. Um, a tile manager, which as you saw, I could split vertically and horizontally and status bars, you might have seen the Emacs, you like vertical lines and horizontal lines, pop-ups for search and find file. Um, room for lots of other stuff, that's just what I've got kind of mostly working at the moment. And there's, there's lots of future, lots of things I still want to do. Um, all the interfaces I've, so uh, the last few weeks, last, on and off over the last few weeks, I've been pushing myself to get it so we can do, put images and bullet lists and all this stuff so I could use it, use it for my presentation. And that's been a really valuable exercise because it's, it's pushed me to actually use all the interfaces that I've built and use them in a way that I hadn't, sort of, I didn't really have time to rebuild too much of it and I was using it. So I found a lot of warts in the, in the interface, a lot of things that, gee, that actually doesn't work so well. So having, having gone through that experience, having sort of built a stack all the way to the top, I need to go back and think, well, which of those bits were good, and a lot of them were, and which of those bits were bad, and a lot of them were, and, and rationalise that. Um, I started out writing unit tests, and then I got distracted. I've got to go back to that, because there's, there's a bug. It, it, certain edits at the moment will cause the whole thing to crash, which is I'm a bit uncertain about editing, and, and probably good unit tests would have caught that sooner. Yeah, lots more fun. Okay. Copy and paste is interesting. Because when you, when you copy, what are you copying? When the, in Emacs, what you see is what's in the buffer. You're obviously copying what's in the buffer. So when you copy a section from a, um, a buffer that shows you a directory, you actually get all the bytes, all the text that tells you what the, what's in the directory. Um, when I'm doing that in, in Edlib, what do I want to copy? Do I want to copy the thing that's being drawn on the screen for me? Or do I want to copy what's actually in the document, um, and the answer's not always the same. I mean, if I did a copy-paste here, do I want to get a, a bitmap of the image, or do I want to get the text, or I don't know exactly what the answer is. Um, I think there probably is an easy answer. I've just got to sit down and, and the answer is really, well, it depends, and I've got to find a way of being able to say it depends. So it's, it's not an insolvable problem, it's just a problem that needs to be solved. Um, yeah, as like I said, I'd like bindings for Lua and Rust and not COBOL, no, other things. I'd like VI-like key bindings just to show it can be done. Um, I'd like hex mode to be able, to, I'd like to be able to say this is an EXT file system superblock or I'd like it to be able to tell me this is an EXT file system superblock, would you like me to draw it differently and just change the rendering for that section of the buffer so instead of it being hex mode, it's something else. I'd really like to implement that spreadsheet. I had that idea four years ago. And Wiggle, if, I don't know if you know what Wiggle is. I talked about it a few years ago here, but Wiggle is my program for, if you've got a patch for an old version of the code and it doesn't quite apply properly, Wiggle will wiggle it into place. But that's a bit dangerous. You really want to be able to see what you've done and make sure it looks right. You don't want to do it blindly. Um, I usually do it blindly and sometimes I regret that. So I, I built this editing functionality in the Wiggle, so it's like a browser, you can watch what is happening. But I, I was writing all this code that's already in Emacs, and it was frustrating that I spent all my time writing an editor instead of writing the Wiggle functionality I needed. So I, I want to plug in for Wiggle. Well, I either want to plug Edlib into Wiggle or Wiggle into Edlib. I'm not sure which way around it goes. It depends on that question of whether we need only one more editor or whether we need one more editor is never enough. Um, yeah, so those are the, the sorts of things I want to do, and I, I hope, oh, email client. I, to me, I see email is actually one of the big driving factors. I, I switched to using not much in Emacs, which is kind of good. It's got a lot of good features, but a lot of it's really clunky too, and I don't want to dive into the Ebis code to fix that. I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, I'd rather write a whole new editor than to dive into the Emacs code to fix it. I'm sorry, not invented here, I know. Um, so that's Edlib. It's, I thought it was like a naked bollard. It's just there, it's waiting. I mean, the bollards around here are wonderful, aren't they? They're, it's like a little family. Well, I was wondering, is it? If it's like a little family, then one more just is always welcome, right? If it's a village, one more bollard is always a good thing. But 
If they're all individuals, do we really know another one? I don't know. Maybe it's the same question, but you yeah, Edlib's that naked bollard just waiting for you or for me or for anyone to come and decorate it and make it, make it the editor that you want, the editor that I want to use. And uh, all the code is on GitHub. The last few weeks of code is in a separate branch called Devel because it's all really messy and not broken up into proper commits and not something I really want to claim as mine, but I thought I'd put it there because I really should. And um, over the next few weeks, all the important functionality will migrate into the master branch, I, I swear. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Edlib. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, good. take the microphone, it's probably safest. <laughs> I suppose I've got two questions here. The first one, you said the, if, um, if I'm correct, the text buffer was dynamic. Was yeah, that well, the text, the text buffer, as it's written at the moment, is dynamic. It grows. It has, in fact, it has unlimited undo. Well, it, it never I'm, forgets undo at the moment. I suppose moment. what I'm saying is if, if the contents of the file you're editing changes, will that update? Well, no. Oh, well, it depends on the text buffer. So the, the text buffer, I mean, a text buffer holds the text. It's not, you're not editing the file, you're editing a copy of it. I think we all understand that. So if, mm -hmm. if that's what I've called a buffer, exactly. Yeah. Um, when, when, not if, when I write uh, the document that kind of maps a file directly, then editing that will edit the file directly. Well, uh, the, the, I think there might still be Certainly, if the file changes, if the file changes, then that will be reflected as soon as the, as soon as Edlib finds out that it's changed. You, I might need an iNotify to, to get that, but I would want to do that. So yeah, as soon as the file changes, it, it should just appear a bit different in the buffer. Okay. Uh, second question is on the plugins. Yep. Um, do you have a grammar associated with that, or is it? Is there, there any scope in the future for a community editing of, the, of, of these uh, plugins, or is it, uh, is it going to be a, you've got to learn a, um, a new way of doing things in order to write the, uh, the plugins? Um, well, the plugins, in theory, you can write in whatever language is supported, currently C and Python and hopefully others. Um, the plugins communicate with the rest of the editor through a particular set of commands, which, as I said, have the particular sort of arguments. So anything you want to do, you send a command to something. Um, so yeah, obviously you need to learn how you'd need to learn what the set of commands is that you can send. You know, um, but hopefully I'll be able to document that. And um, yeah, if you can write Python, you should be able to write an extension without much trouble. Um, so I assume it's self-hosting effectively, or it's featureful enough that you can use it to hack on itself? You, uh, Almost? Mm, not really. Well, as I said, <laughs> I don't have copy-paste yet, and it's, you, know, you need that a lot, actually, to move code around and stuff. Uh, that is certainly a, a short-term goal. Um, I didn't quite get there. You know, I had to prioritise, and there's a lot of... A lot of times I thought, you know, I could make this better, but no, and perfect is the enemy of good. I, it's a mantra. I keep telling myself that because I, I have to take a long time to learn. But yeah, leave it, do other stuff, come back to it. And by the time I come back to it, I'll actually know a lot more about how the editor works and I'll probably do it a lot better if I leave it. So yeah, self-hosting is hopefully not too far away. How do, so the, the, the question was key mappings, how are they implemented? Is there a separate config file? And well, you, up to you. So there's, it, it, you can create a plugin that does what you like. If you, you, create a, you create a layer that goes at the back and it'll catch all the keystrokes. And if you've written that to read a config file, then you can put the stuff in the config file. And if you've written that to have a hard-coded set of bindings, then you've got a hard-coded set of bindings. 
Um, so my current mode-emacs.c has got a hard-coded set of bindings. Um, other bits of code, whether in Python or C, add bindings in various ways. Um, but yeah, that again, that's not a policy decision that Edlib makes. Um, and that's a policy. I may change my mind several times over the coming months as to what's best. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's a good question. Are marks just uh, offsets into the buffer, or can they be relative? Like, can they be evaluated by a function? Well, currently, marks um, belong sort of belong to a pane and to the buffer. So the the document has two longs, I think, of space in the mark where it puts stuff, and it. Whenever the document, whenever the document changes, it can, it may well have to go through all the marks to update that. So, for instance, in the text buffer, the mark contains a pointer to a, a chunk of text and an offset into that chunk of text. So, if that chunk of text gets split or deleted or something, then when the document makes that change, it looks at nearby marks and says, "Oh, that one needs fixing. That one needs fixing." And sometimes crashes. That's the bit that sometimes crashes my code. Um, but yeah, it's kind of up to up to the document to decide how to, what how the mark is implemented. In if I'm mapped mapped dev SDA, then the mark would point just to a fixed index because there's no insert delete opportunity there. Um, in a directory, the mark just has a pointer to a internal structure in a linked list of the directory. Um, there is yeah, I, I I think I need to add something more to marks. I was thinking that, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So marks will might get cleverer. They, they're kind of a very important part of communicating between the different parts. And yeah, thanks. Any more questions? OK, well, that wraps up this. <laughs> Except I would like to present on behalf of LCA this small token. And I'm sure you'll really enjoy it, given your puns on your last slide. Yes, I've uh, heard what's in it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Neil.